little bit like we're on trial. <laughs> we're going to as well for everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure because, as I had said, you know, so many of these people here have been in our house echoing. And the echoes, as you know, uh, continue there. There's something which don't stop. And, um, you know, I think he wrote so much about a stencil of himself, of his fear, always, that he was the guy who simply wasn't going to be good enough. Whatever the task was, whether it was protecting his children, whether it was saving his marriage, whether it was fixing anything, uh, he was doomed, inherently, to fail at this job. And he writes away his worries in all these stories. And in this, seeing this, in this collection now, the thing that's now, it's progressional. You know, the earlier stories are, are in the beginning. And you go along, first of all, I, I grow up in it. You know, the, uh, the, the wreckage of, a, of an outdoor boy and my brother. Um, and he stays the same. You know, he moves to the country from Brooklyn. And he takes Brooklyn with him. And he tries to make it happen around him. You know, it's this, this constant hope that he can persevere uh, in the wild, which terrifies him. You know, his mother was a naturalist and you know, kind of ingrained in him an absolute fear of nature, which he was <laughs> convinced was hunting him down for the rest of his life, which of course, I guess it is. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the very first story, when I was three years old. And, and I was a worker. Uh, he knew the difference between us early on. I was the outdoor kid, and he was the interior man. Everything that happened in, in him was in his mind. You know, He lived that way. Um, so this is a small piece in the beginning of this. Uh, and he always liked to give away a point of view, uh, even when it's about <coughs> someone looking at him. <laughs> Perception in this story, widow. Water is the plumber, who of course he always thought were far wiser people than he could ever possibly be. They understood things of this kind, which were baffling to him. And he was always the wise professor who proved himself to be an absolute idiot um, <laughs> in the eyes of the world. And I feel that, that that's how I perceived him too. And of course, he was my hero, so he couldn't have been more wrong on one thing. What to know about Henry? <laughs> is how little we do to deserve it, how simple it is to give, how hard to lose. I'm a plumber. I dig for what's wrong. I should know. And what I think of now as I remember pain is the fat young man and his child, their staggering house, the basement filled with death and dark water, the small perfect boy on the stone cellar seps who wept, the widow's coffee gone cold. Saturday morning, the pickup trucks were going to the dump, and men would leave off trash and hard fill, stand on tailgates, spitting, talking, complaining, shooting at rats or nothing, firing off, picking for scrap, and I drove to see the professor and his catastrophe. His house was tilted, needed jacks. The asbestos siding was probably all that kept the snow out. His drain pipes were broken. And I could see the damp spots where water wasn't carried off, but spilled to the roof of his small porch to eat its way in, gradually soften the house for bad weather leaks. The lawn at the side of his drive was rutted and soft, needed gravel. The barn he used for a garage would have to be coated with creosote or rot in the fall. The child's bright toys lay in the yard like litter. The cornfield behind his house went off to soft meadow and low hills, and everything was clean and growing behind where they lived. For the view they had, they might as well have owned the countryside. What they didn't own was their house. He met me at the back steps, all puffy and breasted in his t-shirt, face in the midst of a curly black beard, dirty glasses over his eyes like a mask. He shook my hand as if I were his surgeon. He asked me to have coffee, and I told him I wouldn't now. A little boy came out, and he was beautiful. Blonde hair and sweetly shaped head, bright brown eyes, as red from weather, his father was pale. A sturdy boy with a rounded stomach, you want to cup with your hand as if it were a breast, and teeth as white as stone, as bone. 
He stood behind his father and circled an arm around his father's heavy thigh, put his forehead in his father's buttocks, and peeped out at me. He said, is this the fixing man? Will he fix our pump? Samuels put his hand behind him and squeezed the boy's head. He said, this is the plumber. He raised his eyebrows at me and smiled. And I liked the way he loved the boy and knew how the boy embarrassed him, too. That was my father. That was all father. And I want to jump forward uh, to him consuming yet another character who is family. And this is the beginning of Ralph Duck, which became the seed for girls in the North. I woke up at 525 because the dog was vomiting. I carried 75 pounds of heaving gold retriever to the door and poured him into the silver moonlit snow. Good boy, I said, because he'd done his only trick. Outside, he retched, and I went back up, passing the sofa on which Fanny lay. I tiptoed with enough weight on my toes to let her know how considerate I was <laughs> while she was deserting me. She blinked her eyes. I swear I heard her blink her eyes. Whenever I tell her that I hear her blink her eyes, she tells me I'm lying, but I can hear the damp slap of lash after I've made her weep. In the bed, warm again, noting the red digital numbers, 529, and certain that I wouldn't sleep, I didn't. I read a book about men who kill each other for pay or for their honor. I forget which, and so did they. At 5.45, the alarm would buzz at 6. I would make a pot of coffee and start the wood stove. I would call Fanny and pour her a coffee into her mug. I would apologize because I always did. And then she would forgive me if I hadn't been too awful. I didn't think I'd been that bad. And we would stagger through the day exhausted, but pretty sure we were all right. And we'd sleep that night, probably after sex, and then we'd awaken in the same bed, to the alarm at six o'clock, or the dog, if he'd been run, returned to the frozen deer carcass he'd been eating in the forest on our land. He loved what made him sick. The alarm went off, I got into jeans and woolen socks and a sweatshirt and went downstairs to let the dog in. He'd be hungry, of course. <laughs> um, these stories just continue to build and populate, you know, almost like a like a cubist portrait of of him, of all his of all his fears, um, and it's just beautiful to see them written away. You know, everything that was true, he he lied into fiction. <laughs> you know, and um, it's it's wonderful to see him again. You know, I was always. I'm sad by the way he saw himself so often, because to so many people he was a powerful figure in their defense. He was the bear, and we have all the little, since we were children, given him little statues of bears from various places we've been because he was this big bear of a man. And he liked that as, a, as an icon of, of who he was. His defense was impermeable, it was total, but, uh, but his interior was always frail. And it was an interesting thing I always felt about him. How he found a way to tell us uh, to be worried and that we'll make it. I think it was his uh, eternal message. You know, we're all doomed, but we're all gonna survive. <laughs> and uh, I, took a, I took a quote from, from uh, an essay he'd written called Deaths of All Things. And, um, it, it goes, um, stories are about ending and about endings. And of course, they're also the heartfelt prayer, the valiant promise that what we've loved might live forever. And I think that was both for him language and the people he loved. Yeah. So it's wonderful to hear his stories and your voices. Uh, friends. I love that line that you read, he loved what made him sick. He loved what made him because sick. Because I, I feel that that line so much captures so many of the, the stories in the book and what yeah. he wrote out of. But I think one of his, one of the, I think what makes his stories so Fred 
if you will, is that he was able to write about these dark and painful emotions of his characters, and yet when you read the stories, you felt soothed by them. I never felt the darkness of the stories in a way. I felt a lot of darkness. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Just enough to the, let some light and air in. And I know what you're saying. He uh, offered a, a um, window into humanity. Always humanity. These characters. Yeah. We're, we're always as broken as, as we suppose we might be. You know, I think that he was always studying us for our cracks. Mm. And I, I love the way he would, he would go into a room and listen for the, uh, you know, listen to the story. I, I, I'm not an oral person. I, I'm a total visual person. So for me, everything has to be visually rendered in order for me to make sense of it or to even recall it. He was very oral, like one loves his dialogue. Oh, the talk, and, yeah. the talk in there. You know, you can see, you see him like, walk into a cafe or something and I would be listening to, to them at the table. And my father would be listening to everyone. He would have been a great spy, and I think that's why yeah. I love spy. He loved spy you know, books so much because he just imagined that would be his other, his other life. And uh, you know, he'd walk into a place and, and all it would take is, is anybody sitting down near them, you know, man, a woman, anybody. And one of them would say, you know, I haven't been able to see you since the thing. And my dad would just lean back, and I'd just hear him say, thank you. <laughs> there it is. Now I'm going to go home and write the thing. <laughs> and it's going to be awful. <laughs> and somehow, you're going to get out of it. You know, one of you will make it through, although miserably. <laughs> say that having read, um, a, you know, Fred wrote a lot, and to choose 30 stories out of the approximately 90 that he wrote, I will say there was a great deal of darkness. Um, and I, I feel like I know what you mean, Jill, in the sense that the ones that um, sort of rose up and are here in the book, they, they, they offer something that probably I was responding to, which is why they're in the book. Um, they were all well written, he's Frederick Bush. Um, the, the, it wasn't as difficult as you might think to choose the one, now a couple of them I knew immediately, like Ralph the Duck and, and Metal Fatigue. It's, mm -hmm. it's interesting because I don't actually remember names, but Metal Fatigue, I knew it the minute I read that story, I thought I will always remember this story. And so there were certain stories as I went through that I knew would just automatically be there, but um, the, there's a pressure under the uh, text that rises up in a certain kind of way a little bit more than the ones that stayed um, on the table. So it, it wasn't, it was a big project. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't like I was weighing back and forth, like should this go, you know, there were extra ones that I sent in thinking that we would have to cut and we didn't. So, um, so it wasn't, I, you know, I'd be lying to say that it was a sense of like, oh, what will I do? It wasn't, it wasn't like that. Um, it, sort of self-solving in, in a certain way. But there were, um, there are, and as I listen, there are three things that came to me um, as, as I went through the book and as I listened to you um, talk about him tonight. And one is his tremendous sense of place. And it's interesting, Ben, that you say that he brought Brooklyn with him upstate. Um, you knew that. I'm not sure a reader necessarily knew that. Right. Because for me, I, I didn't know that. Um, and, I mean, I knew that Brooklyn part, but I didn't know that he had brought Brooklyn upstate in a particular way. So that, but he certainly knew upstate, and the right. sense of place, including the Brooklyn stories, but the sense of place is so impeccably rendered. I mean, there's not a wasted word in anything you heard here tonight or anything that you'll read in this book. There's not one wasted word, and yet it just, it just explodes um, in in three dimensional kind of way, and. And it's interesting to me, um, having just come back from the Midwest, where I've really never been in a situation where you can actually see completely around you the horizon. Um, it was it was quite an experience for me. And Fred's <coughs> sense of place is exactly the opposite. There are hills, there are forests, there is snow, there is a sense of nature um, blinding the characters constantly. So it's it's it, it's perfect how he renders his sense of place to, these are, the, these are the people that are dealing with this blindness given to them by nature, you know, the, 
the struggle, the daily struggle of dealing with the snow, dealing with the hills. What are you going to meet when you go up that curve? You're not going to see the horizon. What is it like to not see the horizon? Very claustrophobic, and he captures that perfectly, um, of course. And the second thing is dialogue, which was also mentioned tonight. And we know that he loved Hemingway, and and Hemingway, you know, started a, I think a little change kind of thing, not just with the language, but with dialogue, and, and particularly in, in how it was reported. And and J. D. Salinger, who was also um, for quite a while an admirer of Hemingway, and then apparently called the Nick Adams stories um, journal entries. But before that, I think that you can see the influence. And if you read Salinger's stories, uh, not as much I think in Catcher, but if you if you look at the stories. His, his sense of dialogue is amazing. It's just amazing what he's all of a sudden doing with dialogue. And I think that Fred carries that on, not in the same um, time period, of course, because he's writing later, but he captures with that same sense of immediacy, which is a very difficult thing to do. And this may be why he's referred to as a writer's writer, because if you want to learn how to write dialogue, you can go and read. Um, Bush knows exactly how to get it down there. It's amazing, the, the ear. Um, and the third thing that I think, which, which Ben was referring to in a certain way, is that um, Fred intuitively knew that if you're going to write anything that's worth giving to a reader, you have to expose yourself. You can't fake that. And I think so many people that are trying to write or that are writing still try and think that they don't have to expose themselves. And I think Fred showed us that it's just not true. And he had the courage or maybe the need. What difference does it make? He came out time and again and said, I will give you something truthful. You know, I can't, I can't give you a story that's not a piece of my viscera. And he did it again and again and again. And that's, that's what you have here. You have the real stuff. Um, and the reader knows it. A reader will always know it without even knowing why. So um, I was very pleased to be asked by Jill to, to put this collection together. That's such an interesting comment that you, you made, Liz, about the, um, the exposing of oneself. I think what's interesting is that you, I never felt reading the stories that they were autobiographical, and yet he did do exactly that. Exactly. exactly. I, don't, I don't think they have to be right. autobiographical, yes, but they have to be emotionally something that's risky for you to, you know, that's, it's, that's what writers are here for. And I think that goes back to why you said you felt comforted by some of the mm -hmm. stories, that they weren't completely dark, because, you know, it's the writer's job to say all those things that aren't being said, and it's a scary job to have, as it says in the dangerous but um, but if somebody says them, you think, oh, I'm not the only person that has felt that, and that's a huge gift. Back to your sense of place, um, you know, all the places rendered in here, he has been. You know, if he's in a psychiatric ward, he's in a psychiatric ward, and he's paying attention to the smell and the color of the chairs, and all this stuff is is coming in, and all these <coughs> moments, whether he's made up all the other characters, which is perfectly possible. Uh, he hasn't made up the feeling of that space. Mm -hmm. And you're going back to the, the place in the countryside, you know, he did think the countryside was after him. Well, so he was paying attention to the animal. Well, I'm, I'm you know? with it. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever been to Hamilton, New York, yeah, you know. Yeah, because you know the country's after yeah. Yeah. So he was writing those details, and when he writes about a plumber, it's because he was the professor standing there not knowing how to fix anything, and the wizard would show up. And he was paying, you know, absolute attention to every single aspect of that, you know, masterful specialist's, uh, you know, creation of, of the mystery. And so all of that was recorded in one mistake after another, of course, which is how you live in the country. You don't live by knowledge. You live by, you know, surviving your mistakes. And, and these were just a list of all of them. <laughs> you know? But I also love how the plumber says, I'm a plumber. I dig for what's wrong. Yeah, I should know. That's what Fred does too. Right. So he's both. That's At the same the time, it gets to be both. Yeah. Something you say in your memoir that struck me: you said your parents were madly in love. And you think, of course, they wouldn't just be in love; they'd be madly in love. <laughs> Fred was so, and you two were very intense people. And I have to confess, I loved my parents very much, but they had a very 
bad marriage. And there were times I would have a fancy that I would have liked to have been Fred and Judy's child. It <laughs> might work out because I was 11 years older than that. <laughs> you also have the ability to collapse time and those differences. And it also has to do with the dialogue. And this particular story, the story Widow Water, about the little boy and the plumber. Yeah. And the little boy says to the plumber, do you need any help? I said, Mac, you old helper. Hello, do you need any help? I had a boy like you, a little bit big like me, a little bit big, except now he's almost a daddy too. He said, is he your daddy now? <laughs> I said, not yet. <laughs> and I thought that was the most telling line. It was all about how we are as generations and what we fear most. And that comes from a moment that he never forgave himself for, because he he, my father never forgave himself for anything. <laughs> He'd forgive other people, critics not so much, but you know, other people, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their in, injustices and their, their, their problems. But uh, in the cellar, I reached into the sump pump and pulled out a dead mouse. And he intuitively thought I was going to drown immediately because, you know, there was water. And that's how my father reacted to everything. You know, was something was going to take me away and he had to rescue me. And so it, he just spanked me. And he never spanked me. It's the only time in his entire fatherhood that he spanked me. And it wounded him <laughs> so severely that I heard about it forever. I didn't read the story for years, of course. I read it 73 or something. And I was three, and I was a worker, and I was down there because I wanted to help, and I found, I found the stink, mm -hmm. which was the dead mouse, and uh, and he always re recalled that that um, his overreaction, but it was all based on absolute fierce defense. It was all animal, you know. He was getting me away from from the danger, and it was just you know that one smack. But that's that whole story is him, you know, is his confession. Of, of all that, and I, I never knew about it except that he apologized until I was like, you know, 35. <laughs> he mitigated it by giving me the act to the, not to the plumber, who was Fred, right. but to the young father. He who divided, he divided also, the guilt yeah. of yeah. that story, and that alleviates the darkness a little bit, yeah. because there's somebody who does it and somebody who gives him mercy. And, you know, and, and the, the, the plumber walks past the kid and says, you know, something like, what are we going to do with your father or your daddy? You know, what are we going to do with your daddy? Um, which is what he kind of thought of the entire countryside. You know, like, what are we going to do with this guy? He's just constantly in, in trouble. He wants to do well, and and he began to slowly study all the people who saved him and incorporated all of them. You know, some part of his future, you know, his future pump was what it was going to be an echo of of what a plumber had said, and he would recite it as if he was, you know, pulling something from Socrates, you know. Ah, you know, it's the jet. The jet, how does he know these things? You know. But all, so many of these things are in there. I mean, the first time I heard uh, metal fatigue was in uh, Edgware when I was trying to build a plane to get the hell out of Edgware in England, where we were visiting. And he told me that I, you know, finally, after my lunacy, had reached a crescendo, where it really seemed like I was asking for a suit for my flight getting ready to leave you know, at age you know, seven or whatever I was. And he told me the story of that he had to come up with something. And he came up with metal fatigue. You know, it's not, the plane's not going to make it because the wings will fall off. There's, you, know, you need special metal. It was enough to convince me at the time. Um, but that, that, I, I loved how, how, that, how that, when I saw that story, I kept on looking for that story to come out of it. And he does mention a little piece about what metal fatigue actually is. But, um, but I just remember that so much as being a kid and you know, hammering nails to make a plane in Edgeware to get out of England because I was tired of being called a yank. And you know, <laughs> it wasn't working out. They didn't have nights. I didn't have a possibility for it. And that metal fatigue was that, that, that phrase that even in my, my small child's mind, I remembered and remembered and remembered. And it always worried me in all future projects, like, like his lessons learned in the cellars. You know, he would remember catchphrases and words and pieces of things and try to reverse engineer a world that, uh, that was always kind of decaying around him to keep it together, keep the ship moving. I'm curious what people think about the 
these stories from the female points of view. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that? Well, he respected women more than men. He knew they were smarter than, than us. So he always liked to take my mother's side on that. <laughs> she just imagined that he, you know, she was quietly guiding all of us. Mm -hmm. and had great respect for her, for that. What's voice. the name of the story with the um, daughter's mother as having an affair? for a very long time, mm -hmm. and she becomes a lawyer just as a mother's lover is. There's yeah. a totally convincing female mm -hmm. voice. Not for a moment did I doubt that that was mm -hmm. a female child and then woman. These characters grow up within the stories very often the way Alice Monroe's characters do. Mm -hmm. you, you feel a passage of time. Both of those things are very, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. In an amazing degree of difficulty. Mm -hmm. And you also think that a novel right? should be over a long period of time, and then you read Mrs. Dalloway, and it takes place in one day, and then you read Alice Munro, and it takes place over a lifetime. So, you know, there are no rules. And Fred didn't adhere, I mm -hmm. think, to any particular rules except those of honesty mm -hmm. and some charity. And integrity. Yeah. Yes, and integrity. I always think of his voice as being very masculine and, and muscular. And, and I think what strikes me about the stories that are from female points of view is how he inhabits that point of view, and yet you still feel his voice in those stories. I mean, his voice is, exists all throughout every story. And I don't know what, what that means, but it's something that I he also read so many voices. I mean, like all you know, all the big writers. You spend your time reading mm -hmm. writers, and you know, he read tons of women writers. He had tons of you know, of women as students writing out whatever it was they wrote, and uh, so you know, he had all those voices also. He would, there was a certain authenticity to to what he was hearing and the way they spoke. And in our house, you know, if you wanted to get out of something, you had to talk your way out of it, which was awful. <laughs> it was terrible for me. I just I was such a simple plan kind of person, you know. Fight in, fight out, but don't you don't don't talk your way out of it, because that would just get me into circular logic, which I would fail to comprehend. I would be out, outwitted. And my mother and father were all dialogue people. You know, there that was a house of dialogue, the two of them talking and all the conversations that you must have had uh, over the years and those those letters. It was for him it was always this constant run of dialogue, so a, a life of language that way. And it was all, you know, you had to be articulate <laughs> in your distress, you know? <laughs> well, so, I, I think his dialogue works, especially for the women characters, the characters that are not typically Fred Bush himself, and that he has a great belief in these characters and these others there. He gives them yeah. that he life, and he, yeah. and he says, that's fine, that's yours, you know, let's work with it there instead of saying I have to control yeah, everything. Yeah. It gives them a little bit of leeway. I think that's helpful, yeah. And that may come from that, that bleakness that comes out of Hemingway and Salinger. Um, did he work with Gordon Lish early on? Is that his, I don't remember that. I think he, I yeah. think he worked with Lish early right. on in some yeah. of these stories. Did Lish publish him in Esquire? Yeah, yeah. So he probably got that the sort of Lish you know, where where, where you have you have yeah, lish lash. You have you have this much dialogue, it becomes that much, but the obliqueness is, is like was like that. You know, but you which, like that. Right. And I'm yes, sure I'm sure Fred did. did. I'm sure he did. I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. I actually just wanted to say there's been a lot of great talk about Fred as a writer. But I was a student of his, and I just wanted to remark that he was the greatest professor or teacher I ever had, and he inspired me to be a writer. So I just didn't want to leave that out of that. Right. Where, where was that? At Colgate. At Colgate. Yeah, I graduated in uh, 2001. Yeah, he had to really work to survive in his class. I would, not, I would not have taken his class. I took six classes with him, um, and he actually uh, let me do an independent study with him my senior year. Um, I must have liked you. 
Yeah, that was intense. <laughs> he, uh, he demanded a lot, and he, uh, he was very quick to tell you when you weren't putting in enough. He, he definitely told me that writing was as much about hard work as it was inspiration, and that's definitely something I've carried with me my whole life. Did you grow your beard in homage? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've had a beard uh, pretty much the last 12 years of my life, so I don't know if it's entirely about that, but he might have been an inspiration. And uh, it, it's funny, actually, when you were talking about bears, that's always sort of been my totem, too. So I think I, I stole a lot of things from him without realizing it. Well, were you at Colgate? Did you visit? I did. Yeah, I did. You did. I did too. Because he would just bring, you know, he'd say, "Come he on." He hired him. Oh, he kept. All, he took care of his friends. He really did. Not only in helping you to promote your books and say good things about them, but he always got you jobs. Mm -hmm. He would say, "You know, I can get you up here for three hundred dollars and plus expenses." <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>